Hello class, it's Professor Gavor. I, I'm going to give a lecture on uh, Chapter 2, Descriptive Statistics from the OpenStax Statistics book. I will not be doing the problems, you know, you're giving examples, but I will probably make another video about how to do, how to use Excel and descriptive statistics in Excel and box and whisker plots, etc. in Excel to do this. So. We're going to cover the following stem and leaf diagrams, uh, which are called stem plots versus the dot plots that we did with the X last week, line graphs, bar graphs. We're going to talk about histograms, frequency polygons, and frequency time series. We're going to talk about measures of the location of data or what they really mean as measures of central tendency of the data. We're going to talk about box and whisker diagrams, measures of, well, measures of location of data, I guess, is different than measures of central tendency, which is 2.5. Skewness and the mean, median, and mode, uh, measures of the spread of the data or the um, range of the data, and something about descriptive statistics at the very end. Uh, I really don't cover the objectives that much, but we want to be able to display data graphically and interpret graphs, both stem plots, histograms, and box plots. Um, the stem plots, well, we'll get into that. Uh, recognize and describe and calculate the measures of location of data. Uh, what are quartiles? What are percentiles? Recognize, describe, and calculate the measures of the data in terms of mean, median, and mode, which are measures of central tendency and then um, recognize and describe and calculate the measures of spread of data from variance, standard deviation, and range, which are um, measures of dispersion of the data. So a stem and leaf diagram uh, create the, you know, they're like the dot diagram we did last, you know, when we did how much sleep do people get. So, um, for example, we look at the significant digit or digits and then we look at that we call that the stem and the leaf is the remaining digit so we have a number like 23 has a stem of 2 and a leaf 3 the number 432 has a stem 43 and a leaf of 2 but it could also have a stem of 400 and um, the leaf of 32 depending on how wide, you know, what kind of data you have and what is the spread of your data. So write the stems in a vertical line from smallest to largest. Well, it's easier to show. Here's some, a data set right here. From Susan Dean's pre-calculus class, scores for the first exam were as follows, smallest to largest. And always it helps if you enter the data, no matter how you enter it, when you do a stem diagram, you want to make it from... Um, you want to rank order the data from smallest to largest. Now, here's the data raw. You're probably going to want to put it in Excel to do that. And um, the diagram is not here, but let's go to the other slide deck since I have two slide decks here. And a, a stem and leaf diagram looks like this. Let me make it smaller so you can see it. So here's the data set. This is the data point 33, where you put, the, or 3.3. .3. You've got the 3 there, <clears throat> and then you've got a 3. There's only one observation in the 3s. So in the 4s, you have a 4 and a 2 and two 9s. So it's like that dot diagram we did that I actually use X's to draw, but it actually has the decimal place here, or the leaf digit. And we'll go over this in class and, and I'll probably have a video of um, that, how to do this, even though I think the quick and dirty way when we use the X's in class was better because why? That's just quick and dirty, do it on pencil and paper. If I want to take all this time and do it on a computer, 
and organize the data and then do this. I'm probably just going to do the X, the dot diagram that we talked about the first week. And I'm just going to draw a histogram. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, even though we will talk about how to do it. Whoops. Sorry. <clears throat> the other thing is line graphs. And it's also called, the f a few minutes later, it's called the frequency polygon. So, uh, again, I would use a histogram here more than I would use this chart. It doesn't matter what you use. In a survey of 40 mothers, and, and again, it's a matter of preference, we're asked how many times per week a teenager, teenager must be reminded to do his or her, her chores. Um, and I have to be reminded equally amount. So how many times do they have to be reminded? From zero to five times. And here's the frequency of the 40 mothers. Two, five, eight, 14, seven, and four. So what they just did, instead of drawing a histogram, they drew it as a line plot where frequency is the y-axis and number of times the teenager is reminded here. And you have a graph that looks like this. Okay, fine. Uh, we could have done a histogram as easily of that. Here's another one. By the end of 2011, Facebook had over 146 million users. Here's the three age groups by which they calculated it or categorized it. 13 to 25, 26 to 44, 45 to 64, and they had this number of users or the proportion, which is called the relative frequency, you could graph that. So that was 45% of the users are under 25. Uh, 26 to 44, we had 36. And 45 to 64, we had 19% of the users. I bet since then it's changed. The younger people have gone away from Facebook and it's become a middle-aged, older person thing. You could have done um, a frequency polygon for this as well. So the frequency polygon is just, if we had a histogram, you'd have a bar this high, a bar this high, a bar this high, a bar this high, and then you would have a, a sh the shape would look like this, except it would be bars instead of a line. Not a big difference. All right, histograms now versus bar charts. Histograms consist of contiguous adjoining boxes. It has a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. The horizontal is labeled by what the data represents. For instance, the distance from your home to school. Uh, the vertical axis is the frequency or relative frequency or percent frequency or probability of that. And we already know what relative frequency means because we covered it last week. The graph will have the same shape with either label. The histogram, like the stem plot, can give you the shape of the data, the center and spread of the data. That's what you're looking at. Where is the measure of central tendency? Well, if you go to this, uh, three times seems to be the central tendency. But it goes from zero to five would be the spread. So this is the dispersion of the data. This is kind of your best measure of central tendency, which would be three. So um, to construct a histogram, first decide how many bars or intervals or classes represent the data. So here's an example. Um, the calculus final scores. Well, they did it from a uh, lower bound, 49.5 to 59.5. And notice that it, 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 the average error is going to be 54.5. 64.5. I don't know why you'd want to have it the, the midpoints. So you would calculate that based on the midpoint. Why you would want to do that on a 0.5. Why don't you have it, um, you know, 49 to 59? And then what would be the average that would be, I don't know. Jeez, I'm blinking out here. I'm a little tired. My mathematical brain is not working. 
let's do this. Let's go uh, calculator. 49 plus 59, can't do this right, 49 plus 59 equals 108 divided by 2 is 54. That looks better than this. Then you do it 60 to uh, uh, 49 to, God, I'm so bad at this. I haven't done it in so long. 49 plus to 58. In fact, I'm going to change this. I'm, I would make it four, 50 to 59. 40 to 49. And then you're going to get, so if I get 40 plus 49, divide by 40 plus 49 equals 89, and I would divide that by 2. I get my 44.5, and I guess there's no escaping that. Then I would do 50 to 59, 60 to 69. So I would just say, in fact, I wouldn't use the midpoint. I'd say 50s, 60s. 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, over 100. Well, obviously, when it's over 100, it's going to be zero. When it's under, because the lowest score that they had was 49. So the 44 in the 40s, I would probably have a different number. And this keeps gives you an example. So obviously, most of the scores are in the 80s. Um, the next most was in the uh, 70s. The next most was in the 90s. And you can just see it from the table. The graph shows you it better. But maybe looking at a histogram is better than this frequency polygon, which is the same as this line chart kind of. Even though it does not go to zero, they don't, they don't have an, they don't make sure that it goes to zero because the classifications are here. And I would have left it at, at like it was in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Now, the reason they use the midpoint is um, if you want to make calculations, you can make calculations on the midpoint. But somewhere you have the raw data. So I would make more calculations on the raw data than this. This is just to draw it. And when we draw frequency histograms, we'll talk about You could do it on a raw score, but it's not going to give you much. Or you could group them into wider ranges, and that will give you a feel for how the data is dispersed. If you have two of them, then that's what the other thing, if you have two sections, you can see the shapes are similar, but they're, they're also different. A time series graph, the x-axis is always time-based. Always time-based. It doesn't have to be year, it could be month, it could be day, it could be minutes, depending on some, you know, if you're trying to uh, look at some concentration of uh, chemical within a solution and it seems to grow over time, it, you might be checking that every couple of minutes. Or like here, it's your annual uh, CPI, uh, Consumer Price Index, which is better off looked at a, a an annual basis, so based on years. The other way of looking at it would be sales. Sales could be done by uh, years, it could be done by quarters, it could be done by uh, months, it could be done by week or day, depending on what it is you're trying to graph. When you have a time series graph, you're trying to see if there are any trends. You're trying to get a feel for in this case, the annual uh, consumer price index is increasing. The years of 2008 and 2009, they stayed. It went down a little bit because that was the Great Recession. And then it started growing again. Um, and it's grown since. So if we look at 2.3, measures of data location, there's three things. There is um, the median, the mode, and the mean. Um, for example, consider this following data. 
the median is the center. The only way you can find it is by without using a com just entering the numbers as is into a computer and having data analysis give it to you um, in Excel. You order it from smallest to largest. So they've taken the raw data that was this way and rank order. So you have one, one, two, two, four, six, six, eight, you know, et cetera, all the way up to 11.5. Well, there's 14 observations. The middle point, if I go, is seven, right? You think you divide 14 by two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six point eight. If you count from the other side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven point two. What? Uh, I want the median to be one number. So when you have an even number of observations, you have to add the two middle points together and divide by two. So I have 6.8, seventh from the right, and then 7.2, seventh from the, uh, I mean, 6.8 is seventh from the left, 7.2 is uh, going the other way, seventh from the right, add those two together, and voila, it comes out seventh. It doesn't have to, it could be 7.1 or 7.2, that would be the median. Quartiles, and that's the 50th percent point. It's the point right in the middle of the day. Quartiles are numbers that are um, separate the data into quarters. So rather than the 50% point, the 25th quartile, the median is the 50th quartile. 50th percent of the data or the 50th percentile. That's what the median is. Half the data is above it, half the data is below it. Q1 is the 25th quartile. It's the medium of the bottom half of the data. So if I go here and I want to find the, the 25th quartile, I know that 6.8 is here. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now in 7, there's a middle point. The fourth point is in the middle. I go 1, 2, 3, 4, and I go 6.8, 6, 4. 4 is Q1 here. And same with 7.2 to 11.5. There's seven data points. If I go 1, 2, 3, 4, I get to 9. And if I go the other way, 1, 2, 3, 4. So my quartiles, Q1, the 25th quartile, is 4. The median is this, because it's the whole overall it's the even number, is 7. But the median is also Q2 and or the 50th percentile. And the 75th percentile, we said, was 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, and that's called Q3. Okay. The interquartile range is the number that indicates the spread of the middle 50% uh, of the data. Where, and you'll see, we'll see why that's important in a minute. So if I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, and 9, my interquartile spread is 7, same as the median, which is a coincidence. It doesn't have to or always happen that way. It's probably rare that it happens. So the interquartile range is the number that indicates the spread. It can help determine potential outliers. We talked about outliers the first time. A value of an outlier, if we're saying a suspected outlier, if it's less than, a value is suspected to be a potential outlier if it is less than 1.5 of this interquartile range below the first quartile, or more than 1.5 of that interquartile range above the third quartile. Well, it sounds like a mess of words until you actually look at it. So outliers, a potential outlier is a data point that's significantly different from the other data points. By this, why we say significantly, we have to define what significant means. It is 1.5 interquartile range, Q3 minus Q1 below the first quartile, or 1.5 that times that same range above the upper quartile. Uh, for the following uh, 13 real estate prices, Calculate the interquartile range and determine if any prices are potential outliers. There's the price. Well, obviously, if you look at it, here's one that's probably going to be it. 
this million dollar price here, everything else is has a range of, you know, say 390,000 to 490,000. But here we have something at, uh, that's slightly above a million. Uh, that's probably going to be a potential outlier. And notice they use the word potential. You have to then decide if it's an outlier or not. Uh, what makes it an outlier? Did I enter the number wrong? Um, for some reason, I entered, you know, if I entered it wrong, it, it could be a data point that I don't want to use. Or if it's a valid point in the data, uh, should I include it in this other sample or not? Do I want it to skew my other sample or not? So interpreting percentiles, quartiles, and a median. A percentile indicates the relative standing of data when data is sorted into numerical order from smallest to largest. Percentages of data values are less than or equal to the pth percentile. That's why we use the cumulative frequency. It tells us that. For example, if 15% of the data values are less than or equal to the 15th percentile, low percentiles correspond to lower data values, high percentiles correspond to high values. So if you're in the, uh, the, the 90th percentile of your class or the top 10th percentile of the class, from looking at it from the other perspective, it, it, that means that the 90th percentile would be all the data that is, if you do the rank order of the of an exam, it would be the people that got 90 or less on the exam. So the 90th percentile, if you're above that, that indicates that you're in the top 10% 10, 10 of the class. So a formula for finding the kth percentile. It may be a position that's not part of the data. So it's kth percentile. I is the index, ranking or position of a data value. And N is the total number of data. So order the data from smallest to largest. Calculate I equals K times N plus 1 <clears throat> divided by 100. If i is a positive integer, then the kth percentile of the data is the position of the ordered data set. So, I don't know. You can't do this until you actually look at the calculations. And the other lecture, which we'll give in class, will help present that better. If i is not a positive integer, then round up and round i down or round up or round down to the nearest integers. Average the two data values in these two positions in the ordered data set. Okay, so here's an example. Listed are the 29 ages of Academy Award uh, best actors in order from smallest to largest. Find the 70th percentile and find the 83rd. Why do I want to find the 83rd percentile of it? Uh, I would probably do uh, something different. Calculate the 20th percentile and the 55th percentile of the same data. Well, the data goes from 18 to 77. And what you want to do is calculate the cumulative relative frequency, and that will give you a pretty good idea of where that percentile is. So formula for finding the percentile of a value in a data set. So order the data from smallest to largest. X equals the number of data values counting from the bottom. Y is the number of data values equal to the data value for which you want to find the percentile. N equals the total number of data. So X plus 0.5 Y. So X is the number of data values counting from the bottom. Y is the number of data values equal to the data value for which you want. Is the number of data values equal to the data value at where you want to calculate it? So you take that X plus 0.5Y 
divide by n, multiply by 100, round to the nearest integer. So they're going to ask you to do the same thing here. We'll go through all of this in a separate video and construct that. Because right now, just let it wash over you. Box plots are something interesting. It's a non, it's a part of non-parametric statistics, which we're not assuming an underlying distribution, and give a good graphical image of the concentration of data. You're lucky in that Excel now has that uh, capability to draw block box plots in it. Uh, in previous versions of Excel, it did not. They also show how far the extreme values are from the data. It shows the measure of central tendency. It shows the interquartile range. It's pretty cool. So you want to construct a box plot of the following data representing the heights of 40 students in a statistics class. And I'm sure this is in inches. Right, be 64 inches. Uh, you know, what is what is five feet? Is that 60 inches? What is uh, so? There we go. Five feet is 60 inches. Um, 72 is six feet. So you have people from ranging in between the two. And if you look at box plots, let's go to the other presentation. Well, we'll look at it. In, we'll look at it in a little bit. In the center of the data. This is easy to talk about. Is mean and median and mode. There are three things that we look at. I'll start with them. Mean is the average. You basically add all the data and divide by the total number of data points. The mean weight of that 50 people, add the 50 weights together, divide by 50. To find the median, rank order them. And we've talked about how to find the median. It's the center. It's the middle two. If it's even, you have to take uh, the average of the middle two. If it's an odd number, you can just pick the middle. There is always a middle data point. The mode is the one that occurs most often. So the following data shows the number of months of patients typically wait on a transplant before getting surgery from smallest to largest. And it didn't say what kind of transplant, but it's an organ transplant of some kind. Calculate the mean and median. Well, for the mean, which is the average, add all these numbers together, divide by two. There's a function in Excel that says equals average, highlight the whole data set and do it. Now it's organized. How many uh, people were here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirty, thirty-one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, thirty-nine people. Thirty-nine is um, an odd number. So if I take uh, 39 and divide it by 2, I get 19.5. So I really want to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, which would be this. Now if I go 20 the other way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, I get to this middle point 13. So that's the mode. What's the one that occurs most often? Uh, 7 occurs 4 times. 10 occurs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times. Uh, let's see what else is there. Nothing else occurs five times. So 10 would be the mode. They don't all have to be the same. Another measure is uh, the mode, the one that occurs most often. And we just talked about that. Mode can be used for qualitative data. It's the only measure of central tendency for qualitative data. So if the set, data set is, you know, what color shirt are people wearing? 
uh, red, 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 green, green, yellow, purple, black, blue. The red is mode. It occurs most often. Calculating the mean, you look at the frequency and you divide by, so here it is. You add up the midpoint of the interval and you divide by the frequency. And that's not exactly right, because what you want to do is multiply the frequency in the specific interval times the midpoint of the interval and divide by the total frequency. But if you have all the observations, you would just take the average like you would normally take the average. So here's a histogram. If we talk about skewness and the mean and the mode. This histogram displays a symmetrical distribution of data. In other words, if I fold it in half right along seven, the right half and the left halves are perfect mirror images of each other. They match up. A distribution is symmetrical if the vertical line can be drawn at some point. In a histogram such that the left and right are mirror images of each other, or if you fold it in half, they match up evenly. The mean, median, and mode of each uh, seven of these data is seven for each one of these. When you have a perfectly symmetrical distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode are the same. This data is skewed a little bit. It means it's skewed to the left. The left tail is longer than the right tail. Here it's symmetrical because the tails are equal. So this is skewed to the left, means the left tail is longer. So I have this data set. It's not symmetrical. Notice that the mean is of this, this particular data set right here, 4, 5, 6, 6, 6, 7, 7, 7, 7, and 8. So if I look at what's my average is 6.3. The median, since I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 data is between five, these two points in the middle, um, is 6.5. And, and notice that the mode is... I don't know why they write it like this, write the mode as a number, uh, as a word, and everything else is a number. They should write it as a number, too. Write them all the same. It's four. There's four sevens. That's the most, so it's seven. 6.3, 6.5, and seven. Notice that the mean is less than the median, and they are both less than the mode. The mean and median both reflect the skewing, but the mean reflects it more so. And if we go, sorry, one more. If we look at it another way, almost the same kind of graph, the mean is 7.7. .7, so we have 6, 7, 7, 7, 8, 8, 8, 9, 10. The mode is going to be 7 again because that's, there's only one with four things. But the mean is 7.7, .7, the median is 7.5, and the mode is 7. So the mean is greater than the median is greater than the mode. In the previous one, uh, the median is less than, uh, the mean is less than the median is less than the mode. So we will, when it's skewed to the right, which means the tail is on the right, this generally happens. So if the median mode and mean are the same, it's symmetrical, like the bell-shaped curve that we're going to talk about soon, the normal distribution. If the mean is greater than the median is greater than the mode, it's skewed to the right. If it's the other way around, where the mean is less than the median is less than the mode, it's skewed to the left. The tail is longer on the left versus longer on the right. Okay, so now we want to talk about measures of central tendency of data. Well, we have the measure of central tendency, the mean, the mode, and the median. They're easy to fathom and calculate. 
but what do we do when we talk about dispersion? The easiest measure of dispersion is called the range. You take the highest observation of the data and the lowest observation of the data and sub subtract the lowest from the highest. And that gives you the spread of the data. That's the easiest one to calculate and the most intuitive. The standard deviation is something else. It provides a numerical measure of overall amount of variation in a data set and can be used to determine whether the particular data set is close or far from the mean. Harder to interpret. But one of the things about the standard deviation, there are two parameters of the normal distribution, the mean and the standard deviation, which is why standard deviation is so important. Because the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve that, we'll, that everybody refers to, is so important in a study of statistics. So um, it's always a positive or zero number, and usually always positive. If there's any variation at all, it will be positive. It's small when the data are concentrated close to the mean and exhibiting little variation of spread, and it gets larger as the mean gets larger. And um, the way of calculating it, there's two ways, a sample standard deviation and the population. Notice that when the, 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 the these are parameters, standard deviation is a parameter, they use the Greek letter sigma, and the mean is the Greek letter mu. And so you take every observation minus the mean, square it, add them all together, and divide by a capital N, which is the sample size, of the population and take the if you do take the square root of it which is this sign it means that you have what they call the variance the square root of the variance is then called the standard deviation and if I take X minus X bar X bar now being with the line over the top being the sample Whatever the sample size is, is smaller than the population sample. So we use a small n. And that average is on the sample. So I take every observation in a sample minus the mean. I square them and add them all up. And I take, instead of the average, this is the average deviation from the mean, in a sense. So how far is something from the mean? I take that, uh, I square it because statisticians, to make it positive, so it's a mean squared deviation from the mean. The average squared deviation from the mean. We want to make a positive. Statisticians square everything to make it positive. Uh, you could also take the absolute value and have mean absolute deviation. But no stat, it's not important to statistics because the standard deviation is so important to the normal distribution. We only use really standard deviation. So x minus the sample mean squared, add them all together. Now you don't divide by n. We divide by n minus 1 because it's a sample. It actually, you can prove it mathematically that n minus, dividing by n minus 1 is more accurate than dividing by n. For the population, you divide by n. For a sample, you divide by n minus 1. The larger n gets, the closer it gets to this. That difference between, if this is like a thousand, if I get to the sample, you know, dividing by 99 as opposed to a thousand, isn't going to make much difference. So here's a baseball team. The average age of the players are as follows. Um, add them up, find the mean, find the standard deviation. We have an easy way to do that. Uh, just use descriptive statistics in the data analysis that is part of Excel. Now, one of the things we look at is the standard deviation is kind of useful in comparing data values from data sets. If the data sets have different means and standard deviations, comparing the data values directly can be misleading. 
for each data value, calculate how many standard deviations away from the mean it is. So we have the value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Now we care if it's positive or negative. It tells us on which side of the mean it is. It's less than the mean, it's bigger than the mean. And compare the results for this calculation. So if I have, um, it's often called the z-score, and this symbol of z is x equals x bar plus z number of standard deviations. So if you solve for z, it becomes x minus x bar divided by s for the sample and x minus mu, which is the population mean, divided by the population standard deviation. We got a lot coming at you here, and we're going to make it look better soon. So here's two things. Two GPAs. One calculated on um, the four-point scale that we're used to. And um, the student's GPA is 2.85. This school mean GPA is 3, and a standard deviation is 0.7. Another student is um, has a score, it's on a percentile score. The grades aren't given ABC, you're given a percentile score on 100. So this student has a 77%, and the school mean is 80, and uh, the, school, the standard deviation there is 10. So if you calculate the z-score for the observation 285, the mean 3, and the standard deviation 0.7, 285 minus 3.7 equals minus 2.21 standard deviations below the mean. If I do it for the other student, 77 minus 80 divided by 10 is 0.3. So this guy is less standard deviations from the mean than this guy. So John is uh, theoretically a better student, is closer to the mean. Is a, so we can conclude that John has a better GPA. Um, Okay, am I going to do this often? I don't know. You're going to do something for the homework for sure. So here's another one. Uh, two swimmers, both from different teams, want to find out who had the fastest time for the 50-meter freestyle compared to her team. Which swimmer had the fastest time when... Uh, so this is the time in seconds. This is the team time. This is standard deviation. So now we obviously know that Angie had a better time than Beth, right? Because Angie swam faster. But the mean on her team is 27. The mean on Beth's team is 30.1. The standard deviation is 0.8 on Angie's team and 1.4 on Beth's team. So if I calculate that like we calculated these, I can find out who is closer and they're both, and faster is better, right? So now the one that's the farthest away from the mean is the better swimmer. So, but I'll tell you right now, on an absolute scale, the person that's fastest does better. But maybe Angie's whole team is faster than Beth's whole team, which seems to be the case because the, the mean 50-yard freestyle, 50-meter freestyle time on Angie's team is 27.2 with a standard deviation of 0.8, and Beth is 30, but has a wider spread of 1.4. So you could use that to calculate it. Now, there's two rules we want to look at. The Chebyshev rule, and gee whiz, there's so many ways of paying. I think they finally decided Chebyshev is spelled this way. Um, I've seen it when I first was taking statistics, they would spell it with a TCH. I don't know that anybody does that anymore, but there was they used to use both versions. So this was a mathematician that came up with this. No matter what the distribution, at least 75% of the data is within two standard deviations. The mean, 89% is within three standard deviations, and 95% of the data is within 4.5 standard deviations. Now notice again, two, three, 4.5. Use numbers or words consistently. This is known as the Chebyshev rule. I don't know how often we do that, 
but for the bell-shaped symmetric curve, and this applies to the normal distribution exclusively. And we're going to use the word normal distribution because it's so central to inferential statistics. Approximately 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of the data is, is within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.75% of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. Why did I go to the second decimal place in plus or minus three standard deviations of the mean? Because that is such an important factor in quality management, which I spent part of my career, that I've just memorized it. And, and I, I couldn't have tell you the two standard deviations or the one standard deviation without looking at this. But you can see, 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. It jumps up to 90 when I go to two, but it only jumps up four more standard, uh, four more percentage points when I go to 99.7 when I go to three standard deviations. This is known as the empirical rule, and it applies to the normal distribution. And it was so important, I used it as the graphic for a course. Here's the one decimal place. So if I have the mean, I have a symmetric bell-shaped curve, and this is the normal distribution. The mean plus or minus one standard deviation covers 68.2% of the data. That's the area basically underneath this curve. If I go to minus two standard deviations, I add 136 more on each tail. And you can tell this is European because instead of a decimal point, they use a comma. And Scandinavian people, this is for you. So if I add 68.2 plus 13.6 on both sides, I get to 95.4. And if I go to three standard deviations, you can see I'm almost to zero. And I'm at 99.75% of the entire data of the population. All right, that's the end of this presentation right now. This was not probably the best because I think you have to pair this now with looking at some calculations. And I think I will go back and use the data that's in this in another video that shows how to use Excel to answer some of these questions and do the calculations. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you soon.